In English-speaking popular culture, it's pretty rare to see the nation of France associated with military power. Whether because of France's rapid collapse during the Second World War, American frustration over French opposition to the invasion of Iraq in 2003, or because of an offhand one-liner in an episode of The Simpsons back in the 1990s which referred to the French as cheese-eating surrender monkeys. And if that last one really is to blame, then I think we have to do some soul-searching over how one line in a cartoon did more damage to France's military reputation in the Anglosphere than some panzer divisions. The reality, of course, is that France has a long and distinguished military tradition and history, one which often casts it as one of the leading nations in Europe, and saw it shape affairs the world over, from what was then called French Indochina to the battles of the American Revolution. And that despite having lost the superpower status that it once enjoyed, France remains a major military power, capable of independent expeditionary operations around the world and possessing its own sovereign nuclear deterrent, as well as a nuclear doctrine that calls for firing warning shots using nuclear weapons. The ultimate intention is not to show that France stands on the same level as military superpowers like the United States or increasingly the People's Republic of China. Instead, I want to demonstrate how a country with a much more constrained budget can closely align strategy and investment, building an armed forces that align as closely as possible with their strategic needs, and thus allow France to play a major role in Europe, to have an expeditionary capability overseas, and to try and pursue the holy grail of French defence strategy, strategic autonomy. Okay, so what am I going to be talking about today? First, as always with these videos, I'm going to give a little bit of historical context. How has the French military evolved over time and how has it come to be what it is today? Then I'm going to look at France's strategic position, the threats it sees itself as facing, and the objectives it has for its armed forces. Before turning to look at the French military itself, including all of the conventional arms and also France's independent nuclear deterrent. Having done that, I'm going to ask the entirely reasonable question of how they afford it all. Because as I hinted in my episode on Germany some 10 months ago, despite having relatively similar budgets to Germany, France somehow seems to be able to afford more of everything, including some famously expensive systems like nuclear-powered submarines, aircraft carriers, and of course, nuclear weapons. That'll send us into a discussion of the industrial base that makes all of this possible, as well as some of France's more radical plans to transform the French armed forces between now and 2030. Having done all that, we'll close out with a reflection on one of France's strategic obsessions. That is just what it means to pursue strategic autonomy, and how that goal both drives and also partly contradicts France's constant push for an ever more integrated Europe. I'll close out this introduction with an apology to any French speakers who might be listening. I'm sure my pronunciation throughout this video will be entertaining. Whenever I've tried to speak French in France, usually the person on the other side has politely swapped to English without even asking. Nonetheless, I'm going to make my best efforts throughout this video. I genuinely hope you find them entertaining. Now, heavily compressing the military history of any country, let alone France, is always going to be a challenge. But for the sake of context, here we go. There are a huge range of factors that go into explaining why some countries become military powers and others don't. Geography, demography, culture and context, and a dozen other factors besides, all play their roles. And France, even before it was called France, had a number of factors going for it. By European standards, the area includes some pleasant climates and some relatively fertile soils. The river systems provide irrigation, communication and freedom of navigation, all of which would help the region grow demographically over the centuries while also giving people plenty of reason to, you know, fight over it. For centuries, what was then Gaul would be secondary to a Roman Empire dominated by Italy. But after Italy lost that crown with the collapse of the Western Roman Empire, there was now room for a new power to take up the mantle of the final boss in Western Europe. The Carolingian Empire, under the command of leaders like Charles Martel or Charlemagne, would forge one of Europe's great post-Roman empires in territories centred on modern France and Germany. The Carolingians would create a well-organised feudal military that would be continuously called to campaign, with their military victories both blocking Islamic expansion from Spain further into Europe, and also setting the foundation for the future Kingdom of France and Holy Roman Empire. And it's at this point we're going to start the count on French attempts to take over Europe. Now that's obviously a bit of a stretch. Charlemagne's empire was as much German or even more German than it was French. But given the criticality of the French territories to the empire, we're going to give them partial credit. At its height in the early 9th century, the Carolingian Empire dominated Western and Central Europe. 
This obviously included many of Europe's well-developed and wealthy areas, although it did fall short of trying to absorb the vast Slavic territories in Eastern Europe, proving the Carolingians had far more sense than many of the conquerors that would come after them. Ultimately, the Carolingian Empire wouldn't be brought down by military defeat, but instead by inheritance law because clearly neither Charlemagne or his immediate heir had ever played Crusader Kings III. When Charlemagne's son Louis the Pious died in 840, he was survived by three sons. And because fairness between siblings is far more important than political stability or the lives and prosperity of the common people, decided the only reasonable solution was to divide the empire in three. The loss of union with the German and Italian territories didn't mean an end to what would eventually become French military power, far from it. Over the following centuries, the Kingdom of France would wax and wane as military power. It would have moments of low ebb, for example during parts of the Hundred Years' War with the Kingdom of England, particularly during times where France's many powerful duchies continued the modern French tradition of trying very hard to pretend Paris doesn't exist. And while French troops throughout history would often win a reputation for being brave and gallant on the field of battle, the quality of the leadership wasn't always there, with it sometimes taking a very long time to learn painfully simple lessons. For example, in 1346, a massive French army caught up with a far smaller English force, but it would suffer a catastrophic defeat with devastating impacts for many French noble families. You would think a battle like that would teach the French a painful lesson, that impetuous, disorganised cavalry charges into the teeth of enemy defences across a muddy field when the enemy has mass longbows at their disposal is probably a bad idea. But if you thought that, you would of course be wrong, because almost 70 years later, a massive French force would again confront an outnumbered English opponent at the Battle of Agincourt, where they would proceed to do basically the same thing all over again. It's a funny punchline, and this is where the Anglo storytelling often ends. The part less commonly reflected on is the fact that France today is not in fact a part of England. Because despite crushing English victories at places like Poitiers and Agincourt, the French would eventually learn their lesson, reform their military, reorganise themselves, and decisively win the Hundred Years' War. And from there, French arms would continue to play a decisive role in Europe with its power often only checked by coalitions of opponents. And even that didn't stop the French from occasionally making a good go of it. The War of the Spanish Succession, for example, matched those who thought it would be a great idea if the same person ruled both the Kingdom of France and Spain against those who thought that that was a catastrophically bad idea, which was basically everyone else. And the decisive Franco-Spanish victory would have been transformative for the future of Europe. But the end result after 13 years of hard fighting was a negotiated settlement that critically prevented a personal union between France and Spain. But this is European history, so it was only going to be a matter of time before the French tried again. The story of Napoleon Bonaparte's rise to power requires more time than I have here. But suffice to say, the man would revolutionise French military power. Napoleonic France would make heavy use of mass conscription armies. It would implement a system of promotion by merit such that it was joked that every soldier in the French army carried a marshal's baton in his pack. And of course the man himself would do much to reorganise and hone the French military into a war-winning machine. Unfortunately for all its power, Napoleon's armies were never up to the challenge of swimming across the English Channel. And so a knockout blow against Britain could never be forthcoming. At its high watermark in 1812, however, the Napoleonic Empire dominated Europe. Germany, Italy and Spain were all dominated by Napoleon's puppets. Prussia, Austria, Denmark and Norway were all reluctant French allies. But knowing when to stop is not a skill that most autocrats possess. Tensions with the nominal French ally of Russia would grow, including over issues like ongoing Russian trade with Britain. And so Napoleon made what could charitably be called a suboptimal strategic decision. Namely, despite the fact that Britain was still there, undefeated across the Channel with the Royal Navy at its beck and call, Napoleon would muster the greatest force he could and invaded Russia. That particular big brain manoeuvre had predictable results. When Napoleon entered Russia, he had a massive army. And when he and his forces left some six months later, most of it was gone. It was a crushing defeat brought about by stubborn Russian resistance, scorched earth tactics and a hard winter. And that harsh historical lesson is clearly why no European autocrat ever again would attempt to invade Russia while still being at war with Britain. Two predictable results.
France would bounce back from the Napoleonic era as it had many times before and would again throughout its history. The French entered the Industrial Revolution only somewhat behind Britain and by the time of World War I they commanded a globe-spanning empire with territorial holdings stretching from South America through French West Africa to what was at that time called French Indochina, now Vietnam. The French military of this era was respected. When the Japanese looked to reform their army after the Meiji Restoration, they looked to France for inspiration. That didn't mean, of course, that French leadership weren't still capable of boneheaded idiocy. By World War I, for example, most countries had adopted a low-visibility uniform for their military personnel. For the British, that was the switch from red to khaki. For the Germans, it was the adoption of the famous Feldgrau. But the French infantry of 1914 would march onto the modern battlefield, dominated as it was by snipers, machine guns and artillery, wearing bright red pants. But the French army would adapt and win respect from enemies and allies alike. Across the various battlefields of the First World War, French troops, both colonial and metropolitan, would prove their worth and their bravery time and time again. France would emerge from World War I as one of the victors, but with 1.7 million dead, 4.3% of the population to show for the struggle. The financial and the human losses would be deeply scarring for French society and the French state. Determined to avoid a repeat of the previous experience, France would go along with the British policy of appeasement towards Nazi Germany. They failed to risk war when Germany remilitarized the Rhineland. Their signature went on the Munich Agreement that granted much of Czechoslovakia to Germany. And when the bulk of the German military flowed east in 1939 to invade Poland, the French military would arguably miss an opportunity to seize the initiative against the weakened German forces in the west. Instead, they would give Germany the opportunity to throw the first punch. Unfortunately for France, that punch from Germany came in the form of an armoured thrust through the Ardennes forest. In many places, French troops would fight bravely, including defending Dunkirk while the British expeditionary forces evacuated back to Britain. But with some of their best formations destroyed, the British having withdrawn and with Paris threatened, the French government split, the Prime Minister resigned, and the new government of Philippe Pétain sought an armistice with Germany. It's this rapid defeat in 1940, I think, which might sit at the heart of the modern conceit of France as a military minor. But in the end, the defeat would not be final. Hitler would not just fight both the Soviet Union and the British Empire at the same time, he'd also declare war on the United States for good measure. And free French forces would ultimately return to Paris in August 1944. Now, the World War II history gets a lot of airtime. But modern French military thinking probably owes as much or even more to what happened during the Cold War than the defeat of 1940. Because France's great power status had undoubtedly been shaken by its stunning defeat during World War II. But on paper at least it still had many of its overseas possessions. And that would see a tired and exhausted France fighting a series of ugly decolonisation wars in the 1950s. For their part, the French would fight extensively in Vietnam long before the Americans became directly involved. In 1956, after NASA nationalised the Suez Canal, at that point jointly owned largely by France and Britain, the French and the British would intervene to occupy the canal zone using an Israeli invasion of the Sinai Peninsula as cover. Militarily, the operation would go fairly smoothly. The Israelis occupied the Sinai Peninsula and the Egyptians and the French seized the canal zone and were in a powerful military position. But global condemnation was massive and the United States sided with the Soviet Union against the Anglo-French operation. Realising that when the Soviet Union and the United States were speaking on the same side, you were in a dangerous position, the British and the French were forced to fold and withdraw. But both of those conflicts ultimately paled in comparison to the impact the war in Algeria would have on France. Because as far as the French saw it, Algeria wasn't actually a colony. Its regions were as much a part of France as Paris or Vendée. The war in Algeria would be particularly brutal. And units of the French military, frustrated with what they saw as the inability or unwillingness of the Fourth Republic to adequately prosecute the war, would essentially stage a coup in May 1958, causing the fall of the French Republic and for a new Fifth Republic to be raised in its place, to be led once again by Charles de Gaulle. And we'll talk about the Fifth Republic in a moment, but I want to call out a pattern you've probably identified. Time and time again in the 1950s, there were moments where French interests clashed with those of the United States. 
For the French, the first objective was often to hold together their great power status and foreign holdings. Whereas America viewed anti-colonialism largely as a vital part of fighting communism. And whenever there was a perceived conflict between American interests and French interests, it can be argued the Americans chose their way every single time. Now, to say de Gaulle was sometimes abrasive towards his English-speaking allies would be an understatement. Some of his quotes regarding Churchill and Churchill's quotes in return are the stuff of legends. But it is under his leadership that you see France place an absolute premium on the idea of strategic autonomy. And in the 1960s, he would withdraw the French from the unified NATO command structure. Now, that point does deserve some clarification, because I often hear that reported as saying that France withdrew from NATO. It never did. France always made clear that it was bound by and would honour Article 5, that if another member of the alliance was attacked, France would go to their aid and expect it to be aided in turn. But they would do so in peace and war under French command, rather than being integrated with other NATO forces under their inevitably American supreme commander. France throughout the Cold War would maintain a relatively powerful military capable of both providing deterrence on the European continent and expeditionary operations abroad. It would remain in NATO and at the heart of the growing European Union, but always looking for opportunities to demonstrate its independence from Washington or London. Post-Cold War, the French military undertook much the same downsizing that many other continental forces did. Manpower levels were reduced, conscription was phased out, and many capabilities that primarily existed to fight the Soviet military were removed, on account of the Soviet army no longer existing. Instead, the French military rebalanced itself towards being a more expeditionary force, with many of its modern operations instead taking place in Africa. Some were relatively successful, like Operation Serval, where something like 4,000 French troops working alongside local forces were able to throw insurgents out of basically half of Mali over a course of six months. Others, like France's recently ended near nine-year anti-insurgency campaign in Sahel region, for example, were unable to decisively achieve their intended goals. Which brings us neatly into a discussion of France's strategic position and its objectives. Now, obviously, no two militaries are the same, but if you look at a map of Europe, you see some patterns in the militaries that exist and where they're located. On NATO's eastern flank, you see a high concentration of armies that are intended to fight conventional wars on their territory or near their borders, essentially, for home defence purposes. Think Finland, the Baltic states, or Poland. I'm sure that has nothing to do with the fact that Russia is right next door. Move a little further west and you find countries that don't have to worry quite as much about territorial defence, but which are seriously invested in European security. And so you see forces that are primarily designed to contribute to the European security mission and NATO task forces. The Netherlands is probably a pretty good example here, although you could also make a case for Germany. And then further west again, you'll find a small cluster of expeditionary militaries to deploy overseas, and who see military clout as one aspect of their global influence. Two nations who fall squarely into that last category are France and the United Kingdom. And since today's topic is France, it's now time to take a hard look at their core high-level defence strategy. Now, a quick note here on sources so you know where this is all coming from. Much like Japan, France is pretty open with its strategy documents. In 2022, the outbreak of a conventional war in Europe convinced the French that it was time for a national strategic review. That review is supported by a proposed military program law covering proposed spending out to 2030 and also specific regional strategies. Taken together, they provide a pretty clear picture of how France sees the world and what they're trying to achieve. And most of what follows comes directly or indirectly from those documents. Now, obviously, it's possible that these governments don't accurately represent French thinking. It is hypothetically possible that all this talk of European integration is just a massive ploy, and that France is actually working towards like a surprise invasion of Germany or a cross-channel invasion of Britain. But I am going to proceed under the assumption that that isn't the case. At the top level of its strategic review, France puts forth a vision. The idea that France will be a balancing power driving European strategic autonomy, and that Europe more broadly will be capable of facing crises and guaranteeing its own security through a credible European defence capability that complements the Atlantic alliance with the United States. And they want to achieve those goals in the context of what the French describe as a fracturing world order. Now, that vision sounds great, but it doesn't mean anything unless it's turned into specific goals, things that France wants its military to be able to do. 
And because France isn't the United States and can't just look at a menu of available military capabilities and say, yes, please, it needs to choose. And so the French set different graduated goals for the different regions that they imagine they'll be operating in. Because France is and remains an international military actor with troops deployed around the world. To give a sense of scale, I've got an image showing France's 2021 deployments on screen now, showing tens of thousands of French military personnel doing everything from fighting Islamic militants in the Sahel region of Africa, to providing sovereignty and security support in the French West Indies or French Polynesia. And unsurprisingly, the French military seems to understand that it can't afford to have the same capabilities everywhere in the world. And so France's biggest capability asks relate to Europe and the Mediterranean. It's commonly said that the French are somehow anti-NATO, but that doesn't come out in the documents as written. Instead, the document states that the transatlantic link, presumably with the United States, remains essential for the security of the Euro-Atlantic area, and further commits France to, quote, contribute fully to all the missions of the Atlantic Alliance. In fact, France goes so far as to identify a unique role for itself within the NATO structure highlighting the fact that it brings to the table things like its independent nuclear deterrent and the ability to respond and deploy quickly in the event of a crisis. There is a clear role here for high-intensity warfare capabilities. In Africa, France sees itself as having a pretty significant interest. France has tried to maintain close relations with many of its former colonies. Many still use a currency that is issued by the French Central Bank. Many post-Cold War French military interventions overseas. Uh, operations like Serval in Mali, for example, have been fought in these areas. And so here, France identifies its role as being a potential security provider and balanced partner in an area stretching from sub-Saharan Africa to the Arabian Gulf via the Horn of Africa. For those of you without a sense of scale, that is a potential area of interest with a total landmass of bloody huge. When you're talking about those sort of areas, even the Russians, Chinese, Canadians and Australians in the audience start to nod in awed respect. Because that is quite the logistical challenge the French are signing themselves up for. And across that zone, the French want the bases and capability to provide security support, training and if necessary security intervention at the request of local partner states. Head over to the Indo-Pacific part of the document and any talk of high-intensity warfighting that you might find in Europe is out the window. France is technically an Indo-Pacific nation, it has holdings in the region. But you can't base the entire French military in New Caledonia and so the French strategy instead centres on contributing to regional stability through influence and partnerships. Essentially in the Indo-Pacific, the French want a seat at the table but acknowledge they're unlikely to be calling the shots. Instead, in France's separate Indo-Pacific strategy, they identify a number of key allies and partners in the region, with number one being India, which is a partnership I'll talk about a lot more when I get to my video on India. Japan is also identified, as are a host of others, including Indonesia, the Republic of Korea, Vietnam, and Singapore. But the key takeaway is the importance of fostering those partnerships and also protecting the security of the overseas countries and territories that France has in the region. Now, real life isn't a video game. If you want to achieve your goals, you can't just turn the opposing AI down to easy and march your way to victory. Instead, understanding the threats to your goals, whether you're an individual, a business, or a country, is critical. And so the French documents set out both the threats to their underlying goals and what they intend to do about them. Generally speaking, the French identify a strategic environment that is increasingly moving from competition to confrontation. To use a workplace analogy, that's when you move from poaching each other's staff or writing emails beginning with the words, per my last email, to asking your rifle whether or not they'd like to meet you in the car park out back, you know, the one where they never bothered installing security cameras. Particularly, France identifies the danger of nations seeking to challenge and circumvent the international order, including through the deployment of hybrid warfare and propaganda. For most European nations, Wagner is an opponent because of their role in the war in Ukraine. But for France, Wagner and Russian operations more generally are a threat well beyond the Ukrainian context. Wagner mercenaries, but also Wagner influence and propaganda operations in Africa have been in direct conflict with the French interests. And so when a vote comes up as to whether or not the European Union should designate Wagner a terrorist organization, I half expect the French representatives to hit the yes button and then sneak around the room making sure that everyone else presses theirs as well. 
The French talk fairly openly about the way China is seeking to challenge America's place in the existing world order, and also the fact that a US strategic rebalance towards the Pacific might have security implications for the Middle East, Europe, Africa, everywhere that isn't Asia, really, which may, in places, require the French to step in to partially fill the void. So the world order is under fire, Russia is throwing punches in Europe, America is turning away towards Asia, and Africa is full of threats ranging from Wagner influence operations to Islamist insurgencies. And so France sets itself 10 strategic objectives to answer those threats. These objectives shape what the military, what the economy, what the French political structures and civil society will need to be able to do. And they range from cyber resilience and the ability to defend against acts of hybrid warfare, to being a credible security provider and an exemplary ally in the Euro-Atlantic area. But in order to be an exemplary ally or a security provider, it helps if you have a military. Which brings us, at long last, to the French Armed Forces. The French Army is the largest of the three services, as is often the case with 115,000 active personnel in 2022 and 25,000 reservists. Notably, the published French figures suggest the French army is less officer-heavy than many others around the world. And it's outright cruel to compare the French army with its 12% officer component to the Russian one, where Private Conscriptovich will not even tie his shoelaces unless an officer orders him to do so with step-by-step -step instructions. Now, it is not as simple as low percentage officers to enlisted equal good. But all else being equal, it does help control costs. So far as French army equipment goes, it aligns, generally speaking, with France's military objectives. There is some, but not a huge amount, of the sort of very heavy equipment you'd expect to need if you're fighting a high-intensity war in Europe. 222 MBTs and an artillery park of maybe 100 self-propelled guns and 13 MLRS systems. But there are thousands upon thousands of comparatively lighter armoured vehicles suitable either for expeditionary use or for mobile use within Europe. 245 AMX-10 RCs, 1400 VBLs, 2600 APCs, and more than 700 infantry fighting vehicles. And if you know what each of those individual vehicles are, or you can look at the image on screen, you will have discovered something, a clue, as to the greatest enemy of the French army. The thing that the French army, French military engineers and procurement officials resist almost at all costs. And that is the Caterpillar track. Ever since the First World War, where most nations figured out that putting track links on something makes it easier to go over certain terrain types, like really ugly mud, most nations have made pretty extensive use of tracks for armoured vehicles. France? France is not so keen. I don't know if Charles de Gaulle had a bad experience track tensioning when he was in the army or something, but for decades now, French designers have been engaged in a ruthless vendetta against the track and have been team wheels all the way. In the US, Germany, or Russia, that is what an infantry fighting vehicle normally looks like. The Bradley, the Mart of the BMP3, all tracked. So, of course, the French army went all in on an eight-wheeler design, the VBCI. The artillery wasn't safe either. America went tracked with the Paladin, Germany went tracked with the Panzerhalbitz and 2000, Russia went tracked with the Muster S. These are monstrous vehicles. The German one, I think, runs north of 55 tons and is commonly described as one of the best self-propelled guns in the world. So, of course, the French bolted a 155 and an FCS on the back of a truck and called it a day, coming up with something that weighs less than 18 tons in its six-wheel configuration. Now, when it came to building an MBT, to be fair, the French were forced to concede. France's roughly 220 operational Leclerc tanks do run on tank tracks. But I have to imagine this caused some sort of mental break or trauma in French procurement, because they also decided to build this thing. This is the AMX-10RC, a 105mm cannon on a lightweight six-wheeled chassis. And before they started getting sent to Ukraine at least, France had more of these in service than main battle tanks. Now, in some ways, the existence of the AMX-10RC should be considered a sort of provocation simply because of the number of online arguments it starts. Because you will not believe how passionate people get debating what exactly this thing is. Is it a tank? It weighs 17 tons and doesn't have tracks. Is it a light tank? Is it a wheeled tank destroyer? Is it a cavalry vehicle? The answer I come up with, pretty simply, is 
it's French. That said, if anyone would like to set the comment section on fire trying to debate what exactly the AMX 10RC is, be my guest. For a military that expects to be doing a lot of expeditionary fighting in West Africa, this sort of design makes sense. Over certain terrain types, wheeled vehicles are cheaper, faster, more fuel efficient, easier to maintain, and often significantly lighter. Both French doctrine and the likely theatres of French operation give them a lot of reasons to favour relatively lightweight wheel designs. And so in the case of all these systems, they've come up with designs that work for them. And for other buyers that are interested in operating in those same areas, Morocco, for example, operates almost as many as the French do. As is often the case, the French Navy has a smaller manpower footprint than the Army, but a lot of capital investment involved. And as with the Army, the equipment involved helps tell that mission story. France has four nuclear-powered ballistic missile submarines that underpin its nuclear mission, and then it has a number of ships that exist to allow it those expeditionary warfare capabilities. There are three Mistral-class amphibious assault ships, a variety of oilers, tankers, support ships and landing craft, and a significant surface warfare and escort fleet, including 21 principal surface combatants and 22 patrol and coastal combatants with the flagship and pride of the French Navy being a nuclear-powered aircraft carrier, the Charles de Gaulle. That carrier puts France in a rather exclusive club of countries that can take fixed-wing aircraft and project them almost anywhere in the world. Now, obviously, the Marine Nationale doesn't operate on the same level as, say, for example, the United States Navy. There's only one carrier, and it's significantly smaller than its American equivalents. There's only a handful of nuclear attack submarines. There's only three amphibious assault ships. But what it is, is enough to give France a bare minimum expeditionary amphibious capability within France's budget. It means that France has the capability to pick up one or 2,000 expeditionary troops and their armoured vehicles, move them to a location in Africa, provide them with logistical and air support when they get there for a designated window, and presuming at least one of the nuclear attack boats is attached to the fleet, remove any surface warfare threats in the immediate vicinity with extreme prejudice. Remove any one of those components and France doesn't have a credible capability anymore. Take away the carrier and any expeditionary force doesn't have fixed-wing air support. Take away the Mistral class and you don't have a way to lift the troops and their equipment and then deploy them in theatre easily. But keep them all together and France has the capacity to do limited-scale expeditionary operations, which is exactly what their strategy calls for and something not a lot of countries can do. The final conventional arm to look at are the French Air and Space Forces. Now, there are some big questions in the 21st century that governments around the world are still struggling with. One of them is whether or not space forces should be their own service or part of the Air Force, and the other is who should control long-range surface-to-air missiles, the Air Force or the Army. So far, at least, the French are actually cleaving closer to the Russian model, with the Air and Space Forces operating powerful ground-based air defence assets like the SAMP-T, and also controlling the space forces. As of 2022, the French Air and Space Forces had more than 200 fighter and multi-role aircraft roughly evenly split between the Rafale and the Mirage 2000 in various models. The French also have a significant tanker fleet, some heavy and medium airlift capacity, including 18 long-range A400M transports. And as we'll talk about in a future video on space-based warfare and competition, their own independent military communications and intelligence surveillance and reconnaissance satellites. To give a sense of scale, this is all pretty typical for a Western European military of this sort of funding level. The French, for example, have more fighter and multi-role aircraft than the Italian Air Force or the RAF. Although the continuing presence of the Mirage 2000 in the force does mean that part of the fleet is considerably older than its British equivalent. But with considerable more tankers or transport capacity than, for example, its German equivalent. Something that's going to become particularly important when we talk about the next component of France's forces. And these are the units responsible for France's nuclear mission. The force de dissuasion, or deterrent force. And French nuclear capabilities are really important to talk about. Both because French nuclear thinking includes some unique ideas, and also because the force itself is very different from those we've looked at before, like the Russian one. Now, some governments are quite nervous writing about the role nuclear weapons play in their security strategy. Nuclear weapons are expensive, make some people nervous, and are often politically divisive. 
France doesn't really work like that. France, when you look at their security strategy, gives nuclear weapons the really subtle position of strategic objective one, being a robust and credible nuclear deterrent. And the importance of that nuclear deterrent appears again and again in these documents. For example, it says that our freedom of action and the protection of our fundamental interests are ensured first and foremost by the credibility of nuclear deterrence, the keystone of our defence strategy. Look elsewhere in the document, you'll find references to France's capacity to defend its metropolitan and overseas territories being based on its independent, credible and coherent nuclear deterrent. In other words, nuclear weapons aren't an afterthought in French defence strategy, they're at the core. If the French defence strategy ever created a Tinder dating profile, I imagine it would go something like this. French Fifth Republic, age 64. Personal values, liberty, equality, fraternity. And in terms of photographs, once you've flicked past the compulsory Eiffel Tower shot and the photo of France convening the UN Security Council, photo number three or four would probably just be them loading a nuclear missile onto Le Vigilante or one of the other nuclear missile submarines. Now, under the terms of the Nuclear Non-Proliferation Treaty, France is one of the five founding legal nuclear weapon states, the fourth in the world to test a nuclear weapon in 1960. Currently, the country is believed to have a stockpile of approximately 300 nuclear warheads. And historically, the existence of the French nuclear deterrent has enjoyed a greater degree of public support than, for example, the British equivalent. Now, when it comes to purpose and doctrine, the French are pretty blunt about what they expect nuclear weapons to do. They don't really mess around with the idea of nuclear weapons being used as battlefield weapons or as strategic weapons against opposing silos or nuclear weapons installations. Instead, the French sort of embrace the horrifying deterrent value of nuclear weapons by building what is essentially a force that is optimised for counter-value strikes a force that is much better adapted at hitting enemy cities in a survivable second strike than doing any sort of battlefield task. And that's because France presumes it doesn't have the luxury of investing in those sort of capabilities, nor does it see a need to. The French term for their deterrent ideal would be dissuasion du faible à fort, deterrence from the weak to the strong, with France being the weaker power. The deterrent was largely originally a way to tell superpowers like the Soviet Union to stay the hell off France's lawn. And as General Pierre Galois put it in the early days of the French program, making the most pessimistic assumptions, we could destroy 10 Russian cities, and France is not a prize worthy of 10 Russian cities. And at a cost of between 5 and 6 billion euros per annum, roughly, between 10 and 15% of the French defence budget, the modern French nuclear deterrent aims to provide exactly that sort of dissuasive force. And it does this by creating a two component deterrent that is entirely sovereign. That is, French warheads on French missiles on French launch platforms crewed by French crews who ultimately take their instructions to launch or not launch from the President of France. And in French military thinking, that independence seems almost important as the systems themselves. Because whereas a country under, for example, the US nuclear umbrella requires its opponent to believe that the Americans would use a nuclear weapon or risk a nuclear war over the territory of Japan, or South Korea, or the Baltic states, which to be fair, they may well do. All the French require their opponent to believe is that the French would risk a nuclear war over French territory. In any case, that's enough theory. Let's look at the two components of the French nuclear deterrent. The first is France's at sea nuclear deterrent. The goal here is to provide a survivable sovereign second strike nuclear capability. That is something that is able to nuke an opponent even if someone else launches an all-out surprise nuclear attack on France's territories first. The force consists of four nuclear-powered ballistic missile submarines, each carrying 16 domestically built M51 missiles, with each of those 16 missiles capable of mounting between 6 and 10 nuclear warheads. And in terms of mission, these submarines have one of the most conceptually horrifying but practically boring missions in any military. The reason four boats exist is so that at any given time, at least one can be out on patrol, and it will go find a location in the ocean where it can just hide and be very, very quiet. Because really, its only job is to not be sunk. Because as long as that submarine is alive, France has nuclear weapons. And as long as France has nuclear weapons, even if an opponent was to completely destroy metropolitan France, they do so on the understanding that hours, days, maybe even weeks later, that submarine might open their missile tubes 
and make them regret every decision that they have made from birth until that moment. Now, presumably, France would see some warning as tensions grew before a potential nuclear exchange, so having four boats in the fleet means that even if some are out for maintenance, if you see tensions rising, you might surge a second boat out there, reducing the risk that the enemy finds one of the two and decides that they can attack. From a defence economic perspective, I'll talk about the French at sea component a little bit more when I talk about nuclear modernisation because their general approach to modernization seems to be to not over-engineer seeking the highest yield possible or the greatest accuracy possible, because nuclear weapons are already terrifying enough. And the main focus, as long as they at least work, is keeping reliability and safety up and cost down. But if strategic missiles are flying, then in many ways it's already too late. At that point, deterrence has failed and you're only talking about retaliation. And so nuclear theorists spend a lot of time thinking about how to make sure you don't get to the point of a strategic exchange. Ideally, you need a way to warn your opponent before they accidentally start a nuclear war by calling a bluff when you're not bluffing. You need a way to message the seriousness of your intent. And so the second component of what the French have come up with for their nuclear deterrence force is a nuclear warning shot. This is the ASMPA, an air-launched cruise missile with a 300 kiloton nuclear warhead. So this is a missile system intended to deliver 18 Hiroshima bombs worth of warning to a given opponent, with the intended mode of employment being as a so-called pre-strategic weapon, with the French and others suggesting that the way this weapon would essentially be used is when an opponent gets to the point that France is on the edge of using its city killers, its strategic nuclear weapons, it would pick a military target belonging to its opponent direct one of these missiles at it and erase that military target from the face of the earth. Because a government statement or a strongly worded email might be open to misinterpretation, but most governments and most cultures understand a nuclear fireball to the face all too clear. The meaning is pretty simple, thus far, but no further. And if the idea of substituting a nuclear strike for a phone call still sounds insane to you, Let's illustrate the potential value with a hypothetical example. Let's pretend for a moment that our favourite hypothetical nations, Emutopia and Kiwiland, have once again come to blows. We previously established that the southern island of Kiwiland is the less populated, less economically significant one. And so now the Emutopians have sent their forces to invade and occupy that island. They do so on the assumption that the Kiwis won't be willing to deploy nuclear force to defend the South Island. Unbeknownst to them, the Kiwis consider the South Island to be almost sacred. Many captains of the national rugby team have in fact come from there. And they are absolutely willing to cross the final threshold if that is what it takes to hold onto them. The question now becomes, how can Kiwiland leverage its nuclear deterrent without actually just immediately precipitating a nuclear exchange that destroys everyone in both nations? Now, they could simply announce publicly that they intend to use nuclear weapons to defend the islands, or they could send a strongly worded diplomatic communique. The problem is, Emutopia might simply think they're bluffing. Simply threatening to use nuclear weapons doesn't cost the nation over much. Russian political leaders like Medvedev seem to make nuclear threats every time NATO or allied countries deliver so much as a rifle to the Ukrainians. And North Korea seems to threaten to nuke Japan or the United States every time their ratings drop and they'd like some attention. That undermines the credibility of future threats. Because unless a country wants to be completely victim to nuclear blackmail, you need to be willing to call a nation's bluffs when they're made. And so Emutopia might call the Kiwis bluff, even though it isn't a bluff. Another option might be for the Kiwis to launch one of their ICBMs. But when one of those ballistic missiles goes up, it might cause a panic. It's going to set off all of the missile warning detectors that the Emutopians have built up. There might be concern that the missile is carrying multiple reentry vehicles. It might be a surprise attack intended to wipe out Emutopia's nuclear weapons or government. And as a result, Emutopia might panic, launch all of its nuclear weapons, and end both countries by accident. And so the Kiwis need a way to send a warning that will be taken seriously but which doesn't risk accidental nuclear annihilation. And that's where the Kiwi clone of ASMPA comes in. Using it, the Kiwis can pick an Emutopian military target, like an invasion fleet, and then using exactly one of these missiles, they can make most of that fleet go away. 
Now, this sends a far more high-stakes message than simply issuing a verbal warning, because any nation that breaks the nuclear taboo is going to face backlash, it's going to face costs. It may face trade sanctions, condemnations, countries may boycott rugby appearances in the country, or increase their support to Emutopia, all to discourage other countries in the future from also deploying nuclear weapons. But in some ways, the cost of launching that weapon is the point, and the reason the message is likely to be taken seriously. Alright, so having talked through strategy and what the French military has at its disposal, it's time for me to do what I do and start bringing in the defence economics. Because as I've been going through the list, you might be asking yourself the question, how on earth does France afford all this? Because as I hinted in my video on Germany, when you compare something like the Bundeswehr to the French military, at first glance it doesn't look particularly favourable for the Germans. Now I'll include the obvious caveat up front, these sort of comparisons are completely fraught with danger. The strength of a military comes down to a lot more than just counting people and platforms you need to account for the mission the force is intended to do, differences in the quality of that equipment, differences in the quality of the training of the individuals involved, and many, many other factors. That said, and with that caveat in place, if you just look at a headline comparison of the French and the German militaries, it doesn't look particularly positive for the Bundeswehr. Based on published NATO figures between 2014 and 2022 inclusive, Germany and France spent roughly about the same on national defence, actually the Germans spent slightly more. That in turn is partly counterbalanced by the fact that before 2014, France was spending more in most years. But very generally here, we're talking about peers in an investment sense. And yet, a lot of the capabilities we described for the French military simply have no equivalent in the Bundeswehr. The Germans don't have an independent nuclear deterrent, they don't have carrier aviation, they don't have nuclear submarines, and all of the power projection ability that the French have. But that's okay, you might say the Germans don't want nuclear submarines or nuclear missiles or aircraft carriers, maybe they've invested all of that money in more conventional capabilities to fight land wars in Europe. Except for the fact that the French army has considerably more equipment in many key categories. Germany has slightly more main battle tanks, for example, but no equivalent to the French AMX-10RC. And the total French advantage in other armoured vehicle categories, like APCs and armoured reconnaissance vehicles, runs into four figures. Plus, the French have more personnel to go with the additional equipment. At sea, the situation is even more brutal. The French have four times as many patrol and coastal combatants, almost twice as many principal surface combatants, and of course, the French have a nuclear-powered aircraft carrier and a larger submarine fleet. Now, of course, these comparisons are not always like for like. The heaviest German frigates, for example, displace more than the lightest French destroyers. But the comparison can also cut both ways. Because there is likewise a world of difference between the German Type 212 U-boats, displacing about 1,800 tonnes, and the newest French nuclear attack boats, displacing almost three times as much and having the advantage of a nuclear reactor. Meanwhile, just one of the four French nuclear-powered ballistic missile submarines individually displaces more than the entire German U-boat fleet. Again, I'm not trying to pick on Germany specifically, they just serve as a useful comparator and help demonstrate the fact that despite not operating at superpower scale, the French seem to be able to fit an awful lot into their military budget. Now, there's probably no one single factor we're going to be able to point to to explain the apparent French military advantage. In fact, some of the factors may not have to do with France at all, but rather Germany being Germany. If we compared the French military to the British one, for example, we might be seeing a different comparison. One factor that probably helps a little bit is the mild purchasing power advantage that France enjoys when it comes to military spending. In 2017, one academic calculated this at about an 8.4% advantage, relative in dollar terms, that is, to the United States. But that can't be the full answer because Germany's PPP advantage as calculated was actually better. So by far the more important explanatory factor is probably the fact that France has more stuff because they spend more of their money on buying new stuff. NATO expenditure figures for the various allied nations divide their defence spending into a couple of categories, bases and infrastructure, personnel, the purchase of new equipment, and that fantastic category, other, with other including, among other things, the costs involved in maintenance and upkeep. You can have three times the military budget of your opponent if you want, 
But if you spend 95% of it on salaries and making sure that everyone has fantastic basing facilities, you know, you introduce aquatics facilities, bring in a Michelin star chef or two, you know, really pump up morale and retention, then that's great. But when a war breaks out, everyone will be asking, after they finish their three-course Michelin star meal, how on earth they're meant to fight with those jets you have left over from the 1960s. Plus, it's likely to get even worse if you fail to update your equipment push equipment in service past its intended service life and the maintenance cost is going to go up and up, leaving you in a difficult position wherein the way to reduce your maintenance expenditure is to buy new equipment, but you can't buy new equipment because you're spending all your money on maintenance. So unsurprisingly, over those years from 2014 to 2022, in every single year, France spent more of its budget on new equipment than the other comparator countries, the UK, Italy, Germany or Canada. The UK was usually holding pretty close. But Germany and Canada, what are you guys doing? Because in a number of those years, the percentage spend in France was more than twice as high as it was in Germany or Canada. In 2015, for example, about 25%, according to these NATO figures of the French military budget, went to buying new equipment, and about 10% of the Canadian budget did. At those sort of ratios, it doesn't matter if Germany has roughly the same budget the French do. When it comes to actually buying ships, tanks, planes, and equipment, they've got considerably less. And that's before you even get to the question of how that money is allocated or contracting is handled. Which, if we're honest about it, can have far more impact on the readiness and capabilities of armed forces than the individual performance characteristics of any given piece of kit. It doesn't really matter if you come up with a machine gun that can handle a slightly higher rate of sustained fire if your procurement system is so broken that the troops only get them 30 years late, and that a cost so high that procurement quantities have to be cut to a fraction of what is actually required. Different nations do defence budgeting and procurement differently, and they all have the good, bad and the ugly about them. And whether you're talking about budgeting or procurement, the French system is no exception. For one, the French are pretty good at working on long budget timelines. The military program that Macron is taking to the National Assembly in the coming months is worth about 400 billion euros, but it covers a time period out to 2030 from 2024. Now, a long-term plan like that means less ability for the government to make sweeping changes year to year, but it also lets you make long-term commitments to manufacturers easier to signal industry more clearly and to reduce risks. You're less likely to get halfway through a program, then find that no more money has been voted for it and the whole thing falls apart. The other factor is the French give their assembly considerably less control over the content of their defence budget than other countries do. In the United States, for example, members of Congress can get into the nitty-gritty detail of defence appropriations, inserting riders, clauses, requirements, striking out particular savings or mandating particular expenditure, which might put the service in a difficult position if it then needs to find another way to fund whatever those cuts were meant to fund. For political reasons, this can also strongly encourage localization of production and spending. No one's going to vote to shut down production of a weapon system that occurs in their district. On one hand, this is democracy. On the other hand, it means the final defense budget might be full of things the military didn't want and have cut a bunch of things they really did. The French approach is pretty far on the opposite end of the spectrum. By the time the whole budget gets to the assembly, the choice is pretty close to simply being thumbs up or thumbs down. And in many countries where the public generally has a positive view of the armed forces, giving the thumbs down to the entire defence budget is not something a politician can do lightly, meaning that what passes is usually pretty close to what the government actually wanted. The military ends up with things it feels it needs, rather than A-10s. There are also differences that are more centred around procurement and project management than they are around budgeting. French military procurement is quite centralised with the DGA, and reforms in the post-Cold War era were intended to give the DGA the best possible chance to negotiate fair prices with industry. The DGA's commissioned officers are usually specialists recruited directly from some of France's elite educational institutions. And there are distinct approaches to everything from how often program managers rotate to how contracts are negotiated and renegotiated, with a key focus being to reduce any information asymmetry between the government and industry. For example, if government program managers are uniformly highly qualified technical experts who might be embedded with the program for years rather than regularly rotating, 
then they're probably going to have a pretty good idea of the details of the program in question, which both puts them in a better position to predict risk and also to more effectively interact with industry partners. It's an approach that partly channels the dueling pressures of procurement functions, trying to build trust in a positive relationship with industry on one hand and also avoiding getting ripped off on the other. It's really easy to make friends when you're willing to pay a 1,000% markup. Getting a friendly handshake when you're squeezing for a fair margin, that can be much harder. Of course, it can help if you're negotiating with a domestic company rather than a foreign supplier. Or if you happen to be the French government in many cases, a company you yourself own. Because in French strategy, strategic autonomy is about more than just force design. It means more than just having your own nuclear deterrent or the ability to intervene overseas without the assistance of an allied power. It's also about the industry and the technology that supply that force. The French place a lot of strategic emphasis on having a strong defence industrial base. And in their latest strategic review, the need for a war-ready defence industrial base made it to number three on their list of strategic objectives, with proposed changes ranging from simplifying procurement processes to revisiting EU rules and regulations that might discourage investment in the defence sector. But while there is an intention to significantly ramp up domestic activity, that doesn't mean that what's already there doesn't provide a significant capability. For example, France is one of the rare few nations that can design and build engines for its own fighter aircraft, like the M88 for the Rafale. The nation has a fairly advanced civilian and military nuclear industry, making it one of the few countries in the world that can design and build its own nuclear warheads, as well as the delivery systems to get them to their targets. And that technology base also makes France one of the few nations that can design and build nuclear propulsion systems for things like submarines and aircraft carriers which obviously means that France possesses one of the few shipyards in the world capable of building nuclear-powered aircraft carriers. And some of these capabilities or infrastructure pieces are unique within the European Union. The European Space Agency, for example, is highly dependent on French infrastructure. When it comes to launching stuff into orbit, it's more efficient to launch from the equator. And as you probably know if you've ever enjoyed the climate in a place like Berlin or London, Europe is nowhere near the equator. Luckily for the ESA, however, there is a tiny bit of the European Union in South America, and the French Centre Spatial Guionnet is thus a pretty good place to launch from if you want to have a space program, as the Europeans do. To cap it off, the French government either owns or part owns a number of major defence firms. The military shipbuilding giant Naval Group comes to mind. Now, the state ownership of armament firms is a can of worms that I don't really want to open up right now. But they can create funny situations wherein all that happens if a defence firm manages to rip off the government is that it then pays the dividends of that overcharging directly back to the government. Now, as I said at the beginning, the French defence industry can't cover all possible areas. Some components still have to be imported. The French now no longer produce their own assault rifle. Instead, the old French designed and built for mass is being replaced with the German designed HK416. But what the French seem to have focused on are high-end capabilities that can't be readily sourced somewhere else in the market if things get bad. If you become dependent on another country to manufacture jet engines for your aircraft, for example, replacing that supply in an emergency if that country shuts you off is going to be difficult. Turbojets are not exactly plug-and-play one with the other. You can't just rip the American F-135 engine out of an F-35 and replace it with a French M-88. Although, to be perfectly honest here, just from a point of pure curiosity, I would pay good money to see someone try. But the key point here is it's easier to train up infantry on a new small arm in an emergency than it is to rejig the supply chain that keeps your air force flying. So all else being equal, you can argue it makes sense to focus on being able to build your own engine as opposed to being able to build your own rifle. But before every middle power out there rushes to nationalise its defence sector, let's add two key caveats. The first is that it's sometimes a misnomer to describe a defence firm as a French company or a German company or a British company in this day and age. Because of the scale and the complexity of the work they do, many of these companies are massive multinationals with large and diverse ownership structures. So when we say, for example, that France has the ability to produce its own air-to-air -air missiles, that's true. There is a French wing of the European defence giant MBDA. But MBDA is joint owned by Airbus, BAE and Leonardo, each of which in turn has their own ownership structures and splits. That major French shipyard I told you about earlier, the one with the capacity to build and service nuclear-powered aircraft carriers, 
Well, that's 50% owned by the Italian firm Fincantieri. So a lot of time when we're talking about sovereign French defence industrial capability, we're often talking about just the French wing or component of a massive, usually European, defence conglomerate. And when you think about the scale involved, that makes a degree of sense. Because from a point of view of just security or patriotism, the idea of just owning your own defence industrial base and producing all of your own equipment can be incredibly attractive. The French can keep most of the jobs and funding in their own economy. And they're less vulnerable to a foreign arms supplier suddenly cutting off supply, for example. But that approach isn't without threats, challenges and costs, with one of the biggest ones simply being scale. The French military may be well designed for the strategic objectives they've set, but as far as customers go, it's not a massive one. And if you're only going to be buying 300 fighters, for example, it's going to be hard to bring the cost of those platforms down compared to an opponent that might be selling F-35s by the thousand. It also means that truly massive mega projects that push the boundaries of what engineering, design and industry can accomplish might be a big ask. For example, France was able to develop the Rafale as its primary multi-role fighter and produce it and remain largely sovereign in doing so. That's impressive, but far from a unique accomplishment. Sweden, for example, was able to produce the Gripen. But, and I mean no offence to Sweden or France here, but Gripen and Rafale are not F-35. And practically speaking, neither country had the funds, the resources or the industrial capability to have produced their own domestic F-35 equivalent and had it flying in 2006 like the Americans did. So the two core challenges of trying to keep your defence industry domestically focused are one, that you may see higher costs because you lack scale. But secondly, because you might hit technological resource or capability limits, you might end up having to produce a product that, while good at a specific role, may not be the best in every field compared to foreign competitors. If the Marine Nationale was to turn around tomorrow and say, we want to buy F-35s to put on our next generation aircraft carrier when it enters into service, then that might make sense from a military perspective. But the need to remain sovereign from an industrial perspective means the Navy will continue buying Rafale. Because at the moment, Rafale is what French industry can produce, and Rafale is what they need to buy in order to keep those factories operating. So you might be asking, how can the French deal with these dual challenges, both in terms of scale and the enormous cost of cutting-edge R&D? The first part of the answer is you sell your weapons abroad to generate additional scale for your manufacturers. In recent years, France has often been the world's third largest arms exporter, and with the results of the war in Ukraine playing out, they're now making a pretty strong role for Russia's traditional markets as well. In terms of the basic proposition of French arms sales, often French arms are positioned as an alternative for countries that would like to buy Western weapons, but would like more generous sharing of technology and less dependence on the US than you would get buying American hardware. And so France has positioned itself as a major supplier to many countries that find themselves in that position, with Rafale as one of its primary exports. The jet is now operated by Egypt, Qatar, India and Greece, and in future will be flown by Croatia, Indonesia and the UAE. And the importance of these exports only encourages the French to be even more sovereign in how they manufacture their equipment. Because if, for example, you use a large number of American components in your systems then that may later give the US or some other supplier grounds to restrict your exports or sales or usage of your own equipment. And as we've seen with the war in Ukraine, there are two ways that a country can get value out of the systems it produces. Firstly, it can use them themselves, but also you can achieve a lot of strategic impact by choosing to supply those systems to someone else at a critical time. But you may not be able to do that if you're vulnerable to another country's export controls. And so France manufactures as much as possible domestically and imports as little as possible. On screen there now, you have the CIPRI values for French arms exports and imports between 2018 and 2022. The measure here is something called trend indicator value, which I've talked about before, and which doesn't cleanly compare to a modern dollar or anything like that. The important thing here is the ratio. Now, obviously, these registers are incomplete, and these things can get complicated when you're dealing with equipment manufactured by multinational conglomerates. But based on these figures, in 2020, French defence exports were about 11 times defence imports, which I'm presuming the French considered an abysmal failure because by 2022, the ratio had widened out 
to the point that defense exports were 137 times the relatively tiny defense imports. And if you're wondering what was in there making up that small component of imports, well, you can probably guess the big items, a couple of drones ordered from the United States, some very light aircraft from Switzerland, some fire control radars from the Netherlands, some naval guns from Italy, and as always, some German diesel engines. As for the challenge of those really massive R&D and production projects, the answer the French usually come up with is multilateral development. The French have a long history of involvement in these sort of efforts. Some have been abysmal failures, and some significant successes. The success of the Franco-Italian Frem frigates, for example, comes to mind. And now French planning is relying on this approach for a whole range of next-generation systems. France's sixth-generation fighter and supporting system, for example, will be co-developed with Germany and Spain. While the next-generation main ground combat system, which is meant to replace the current generation of main battle tanks, among other things, is again a Franco-German program. Now, these programs always face challenges when they're being negotiated, mainly because fundamentally the parties involved all want to share the costs, which is why they want to develop as a unit. But also, ideally, they'd all prefer if all of the project money was spent in their country, development was led by their companies, and the design matched their requirements most closely. But I'm sure everything will be fine because France and Germany have never disagreed on anything. I mean, why would the Germans not want to invest in making the next generation fighter system carrier capable, despite not operating or planning to operate any aircraft carriers? But resolved those issues will have to be, because with the impact of the war in Ukraine now being felt, defence strategic planning in France now calls for a significant build-up in military capability and the defence industrial base between now and 2030. And believe me, there's quite the shopping list. The forward military program law that Macron is likely to send to the National Assembly calls for roughly $450 billion worth of military spending between 2024 and 2030 inclusive. Compared to existing budgets, it would lift spending in 2024 by about 3.1 billion euros, between 2025 and 27 by about 3 billion euros per year, and by 4.3 billion euro per year between 2028 and 2030, with French military spending in 2030 eclipsing 60 billion euros. Now that sounds like an awful lot of money, and it is. It would be enough to make transformative investments in civilian infrastructure or buy at least two or three apartments in Sydney or Auckland. But when you start looking at the investments that the French want to make, the price tag suddenly becomes much easier to understand. There's plenty in the budget for the French Navy, including a suite of new surface warships, and a commitment to try and get France's new nuclear-powered aircraft carrier in the waters and on trial about 2037 or 2038. The new design will be significantly larger than the existing one, much closer to an American aircraft carrier in displacement and capability than the existing Charles de Gaulle. There will be investments in the nuclear deterrent, more refiles for the Air Force, investments in innovative technology like directed energy weapons, so lasers. Plus, there is a multi-billion dollar multi-year investment in space-based capabilities or space targeting capabilities, including programs like Yoda, which intends to put some small, highly maneuverable satellites into orbit for testing purposes. But while Yoda no doubt wins the acronym competition, it's actually one of the most conservative French space-based programs. Given I have an upcoming video on space-based warfare and investments, I won't go into too much detail here, but I will tease it with two simple words. Space. Lasers. So for now, we'll just put France on the sci-fi villain watch list and move on to some of their other investments. The program would push ahead with many multilateral projects, sixth generation aircraft development with Germany and Spain, the main ground combat system, and the Eurodrone project. The Eurodrone is one of those projects that shows the best and worst of what can happen with European defence industrial cooperation. On one hand, there's a lot of technology to go around, a lot of capability. But at the same time, an awful lot of debate has gone into building a thing. The Germans, for example, primarily wanted Eurodrone to be a reconnaissance platform, because this was still in the era of Germany being nervous about creating weapons that might actually hurt people. While the French, of course, wanted precision-guided munitions capability for service in places like the Sahel. There's also, as you might expect given the lessons taken from Ukraine, a massive investment in stocking up on new munitions. 
Billions of euros of new munitions will be purchased, many of which will be missile systems bought from the European giant MBDA. To make that build-up possible, the French anticipate putting a lot of work into reinvigorating and speeding up the activity of their defence technology and industrial base. Various French documents, announcements and speeches point to a range of measures. A desire for shorter production cycles, greater volumes, reduced costs and complexity of weapon systems. The willingness of governments and contractors to accept some risk in order to move programs ahead faster. And the need to look at securing supply chains, including relocation of production not just into France, but also into Europe more generally. All with the intention of creating supply chains and production capacity that can handle something akin to what we've seen in Ukraine, a war defined by attrition and rapid consumption. There's already been some movement in these areas. To take just one example, let's look at the Caesar self-propelled gun. These things have reportedly performed quite well in Ukraine, and Ukraine has recently received additional such systems from Denmark. Before the war in Ukraine, the annual production rate was something like 24 systems per year. As of now, it's reportedly up to 48. And in the near future, they want to raise that further to 72 guns per year. Now, that doesn't sound like much initially, but then you have to remember, that's a greater production rate than America had for the HIMARS system before the war in Ukraine. Or ultimately, that's enough production to replace the entire French Army Artillery Corps of such systems in less than two years. Plus, there's the general point that tripling your rate of production is, generally speaking, nothing to sneeze at. Now, of course, that doesn't guarantee the French will get everything they plan for on time and on budget. This is an ambitious plan that's going to face up against some fundamental challenges that a country like France is always going to face in this sort of race. Namely, that it is trying to keep up in a high-technology environment using largely sovereign industry against far better funded allies and competitors. It's not that the French lack know-how, creativity or drive. It's simply that designing and building cutting-edge weapon systems, things like next-generation nuclear carriers or sixth-generation aircraft, are the kind of efforts that can test the capabilities of even a superpower to their maximum. But those are the sort of capabilities France is going to need if it's going to maintain its policy of pursuing strategic autonomy. Without their own space-based assets, without their own expeditionary warfighting capability, or a dozen other capabilities besides, France would have to make a choice between greater reliance on their allies or reducing their strategic ambitions. And so we must expect that they'll probably push on. But it leads into the final part of this discussion. An outsider's reflection on what it means to be strategically autonomous and the challenges involved. Because few words appear more commonly or dominate more loudly across all of these planning documents than strategic autonomy. Because fundamentally, France respects its role in, for example, the NATO alliance. It wants the ability to be a good productive ally as part of a collective security environment. But whereas a country like Germany, for example, would always be very reluctant to act militarily without operating in full concert with its major allies, the French are very strongly focused on retaining the ability to act independently, to go do superpower things, whether they have allies coming along or not. In an ideal world, the French probably want the existing rule-based international order to remain largely in place. But they would love to be able to stand as their own independent pole of power, balancing out the United States. But at the same time, the French acknowledge that they simply don't have the economy or the population to be that sort of counterbalancing pole alone. And so the solution we've seen put forward in French strategy and through these investments is to foster European strategic autonomy and integration. Because whereas France alone may not have the same economic capacity and clout as the United States, taken as a collective, the nations of the European Union absolutely belong at the superpower table along with the People's Republic of China and the USA. And so the French have generally supported European security institutions, European defence integrations and European defence projects. And the more Europe works together in those respects, the less dependent, or else being equal, it's likely to be on the United States. But if the goal is to pursue French strategic autonomy and defence industrial autonomy specifically, then there's a problem with this approach, or at the very least, a tension. 
And that is, and I know this might be a shocking revelation to some politicians, France is not the entirety of the European Union. And while investing in European industry and forces may be by far the more efficient option, France would never have as much autonomy in how it controls, accesses, and uses those capabilities as it would when it comes to purely national ones. European policy is born of compromise, and not all European states are on the same page. They don't all share the same strategic outlook or priorities. If you want a very clear example of that, look at the not insubstantial differences between the way countries like Poland, Czechia, or the Baltic states regard support for Ukraine and the attitude that France has taken. All obviously speak in favour of providing financial and military support to Ukraine and resisting Russia's invasion. But whereas the French have occasionally talked about providing Putin with an off-ramp, the Baltic states would probably only agree to build said ramp if it led directly into a bottomless pit, a minefield, or a prison cell. Different European nations choose different security partners. Some opt for closer defence ties with the United Kingdom or the United States, or think of Poland's defence industrial cooperation with the Republic of Korea. And so I think one of the fundamental challenges that France will continue to face going forward is more political and economic than military in nature. And it's basically that building European strategic autonomy, the European defence base, getting the most out of Europe's industrial and military potential, will require seeking consensus between these diverse viewpoints. But that seeking consensus often requires concessions, which, depending on your point of view, may represent a deviation from France's own goals of being truly autonomous itself. Of course, critically, if you don't choose to focus on integration, there's no guarantee that others won't choose to go ahead without you, denying you some of the seats at the table you may otherwise have had. Time will tell how current and future French governments choose to handle that particular tension. In conclusion, France has a history of being a great power, and it's adapted to its post-World War II reality by trying to selectively maintain those military and economic capabilities it needs to participate in alliance structures while still being capable of independent operation. In saying that, I don't pass any judgement on the value of the objectives the French have chosen to pursue. But I do make the observation that whereas some countries sometimes seem to make military investments seemingly at random, France seems to have clearly focused its investments on supporting its core goals using the limited resources it has available. And in that narrow sense, I'll proudly defend it as a good military no matter how many subscribers it costs me because it is a force which deploys limited resources to come up with a force structure that closely aligns with what the nation it serves needs the military to do. The result is a military with an independent nuclear deterrent, a strong, mostly sovereign defence industrial base, and the capacity for limited independent expeditionary operations abroad. And if modernisation proceeds as planned, then the future French military will be a major contributor to NATO and the European Union, while retaining the ability to carry out some tasks alone or in ad hoc coalitions. That doesn't make France a true peer of the People's Republic of China or the United States, but it does give them a greater ability to speak and act independently on the world stage. And while maintaining that capability may come at the cost of tens of billions of euros every single year, so far that seems like a price the French are more than willing to pay. Okay, channel update to close out. I know this video has been in the works for a long time. I do hope it was worth the wait. I want to say thank you for the fantastic response to the Ukraine coverage I did last week and some of the other Ukraine coverage I've done. I want to stress I'm keeping a very close eye on that situation, but I'm only going to do videos at what I feel are the right times, where there is a topic that is relevant to cover and enough material to make a coherent point on the subject. The only thing I'll add there is a little bit of encouragement to be careful with the news and updates you're seeing over the next few weeks. Rumours are flying thick and fast right now, some of them made up seemingly out of thin air. So while this is always the case, over the next couple of weeks, can I just advise you be careful. In terms of other points of thanks, my original video on corruption, Corruption Destroys Armies, has reached the 2 million view mark, which is, well, that's something. I had no idea how that video was going to go when I created it because it had nothing to do with things that go boom. But I'm glad that there was an audience there that wanted to understand some of the things that can go wrong with an organisation or with practices, not just with the equipment itself. I am working on an extension of that original trilogy, but I'm not in any mood to rush it, so it may be some time yet before it comes out.
Finally, let me say that I will be returning home soon, so thank you for your patience while I've been travelling. It means that things like emails often get very heavily backlogged. But I do have some interesting things planned for once I get back, so watch this space. Thank you very much for your support, as always, and I'll see you all again next week.